And hello, it's lovely to see you all. And hello also to Peter back in the studio in Heidelberg in Germany. Hello, Valentin. Hello, everybody. Hello. I haven't seen you for four weeks because I have been away. And I'll tell you about my trip later on. But first, let's have some Mozart. This is the second and third movement from his sonata in F major. He wrote a lot of piano music at this time, which was 1783. Um, he had just been married and his wife, you can see her there, Constanze, was having their first child. Um, now he wrote a lot of sonatas and, and especially also piano concertos. And this was really, this marked the height of his success and popularity as a pianist. That doesn't mean that he became worse afterwards. It's just that he focused more on writing large-scale operas later on, and the piano took more of a back seat for a while. You can see in this piece how he delights in his pianistic ability, and he never wrote more virtuosic piano music than this. First you hear a slow movement, an adagio, and I think this inspired Chopin to some of his own nocturnes. After the adagio follows a very fast movement, but something very strange happens because it suddenly seems to come to an end after only about a minute or so. It does carry on, of course, but it turns out that that false ending that you've heard there becomes the real ending at the end of the piece.
Thank you, Stefan. Oh, it's lovely to see uh, to see uh, your comments. Hmm. Thank you, Horia. Hmm. It, it is a wonderful piece, this Mozart. It really has such contrasts and, and, and characters, and it is quite 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 operatic. Hello, Rachel and Paul. Lovely. Hmm. I really really um, enjoy enjoy this music enormously. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more Mozart in the in the series um, later on. Um, it, there's just such such uh, yeah such character in in, in every note. Um, now the idea for our program today was that after the Mozart would be a bit like a, a postcard from my trip to America. Now as I sat on the plane from London to the Caribbean island of Saint Lucia. A large volcano blew up on the neighboring island of St. Vincent. You can see it there on the screen, actually. Uh, I took this photo myself and it was really quite dramatic. Um, it, of course, it played havoc with my trip, but it, it was a stunning sight, although possibly I hope never to see it again <laughs> as well. Now, I did manage to travel on by boat and even to play a concert on the paradise island of Mastique um, but I had to come back eight days earlier because the ash cloud made it very difficult for planes to operate. Uh, fortunately I did have some time to gaze at the ocean and even to swim in it um, so the next uh, part of the program starts with the reflections in the water by Debussy. Um, he also gazed at the ocean when he wrote it because he actually was staying in Eastbourne on the south coast of England at the Grand Hotel. They still keep his room there, the Debussy room uh, where he stayed. And, and uh, so, yeah, um, but actually to me, it's not so much a reflection of, of the ocean. Um, it, it's, and you certainly don't get a volcano reflected in the water here, um, although it does get quite loud in the middle of the piece as well. Um, I think you could imagine yourself in the peaceful Japanese garden which the French Impressionist painter Monet built for himself and he painted it many times. There's a very famous picture of, his, of the bridge in his, in his garden. Especially at the end of this piece there's a definite feel of, of Zen um, as if you're sitting in a Japanese garden as you follow the last gentle ripples of the water in the pond. This is Debussy's first impressionistic piano piece and it is interesting enough in the same key as the Claire de Lune. He even uses the theme of it a little bit. The shape of it is very similar too and you could think of a, fri a fried en l'eau, this piece, as a, if you like an advanced version of Claire de Lune.
Oh, thank you, Sarah, that's very nice. Mm. Ah, it's a, it's a very beautiful piece that, that there is. Oh, Eric, thank you. Nice to speak to you earlier today. Mm. Yes, well, oh, it's really nice to see, to see your comments and to feel that you're there. Uh, that, that's, that, that's great. Um, we're actually continuing with one of my own themes and also with our water theme. Um, but um, we're actually having yeah, my, my own piece now, the ocean waves. Um, there's again that, that photo of the, the volcano uh, that I saw in, in, in on St. Vincent, St. Lucia. Um, now, I'm aiming for a bit of a bigger splash here with this piece than perhaps the Debussy. Of course, it's called ocean waves, not just reflections in the water. Uh, it starts out peacefully, but just as you w would watch the waves going up and down, and gradually they grow bigger towards the end. Chopin, but it's it's a bit of a. Mm, I, I shaped it a bit differently, obviously, to 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 Chopin. Um, lovely. Well, um, uh, with the next piece, the Gershon Prelude, we've actually arrived properly in America now. Um, and although Gershon's parents were Russian Jews, and his name was originally Jacob Gershowitz. He grew up in New York and he's definitely an American composer. Um, now, no other composer in history earned more money during his lifetime than Gershwin. He came to Paris in order to take lessons from Ravel. And the first thing Ravel asked him was how much he was earning for one of his songs. After Ravel heard Gershwin's reply, he said that he should take lessons from him instead. Now, Gershwin actually did have an influence on Ravel's music because Ravel started to include jazz themes in his own pieces after he had met Gershwin. Well, he clearly knew which side his bread was buttered. Um, and this short and fast prelude I'm playing now actually uses Brazilian rhythms and combines it with jazz harmonies.
and that was the Gershwin Prelude. No, oh, thank you. Yes, it it is it is a it's quite a stunning piece. It's one of the most difficult he actually uh, uh, wrote and. Gershwin came to London to record these, uh, uh, all his three preludes. Um, originally, he had actually uh, planned to write 24 preludes, just like Chopin and Bach uh, and Rachmaninoff. But um, in the end, he just wrote three of them, um, or published three of them. Mm. Yes, it, it, yeah, the ending is quite surprising with that jump to the, to the bottom. Um, mm. It is, it is, it is a, it, I think it's, it's a very clever and, 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 and fun piece, this one. Um, now you, next you're hearing something very different, um, a very famous violin piece, the Liebeslied by Fritz Kreisler. You can see him there with his violin. Um, now, Liebeslied means love's sorrow, as you can see there, and Kreisler called it an old Viennese dance tune. Um, originally, it was published under a false name, and Chrysler didn't want people to know that he had written it himself. Most other composers at the time were moving towards atonal music, and he must have felt that he was out of step with the times by writing in a romantic style. Rachmaninoff actually felt the same way. And he lamented that he was living in the wrong era. He's really the last of the great romantic composers. Him and Chrysler formed a famous duo when they were both living in America. They were very different personalities, like chalk and cheese really. Um, Chrysler was usually sunny and positive and Rachmaninoff. When they recorded together, Kreiser was usually happy with the recording, but Rachmaninoff pointed out many faults with it. You can hear this clash of personalities in this piece. Kreisler's Viennese tune has been given a full Russian makeover, and it has turned into quite a different piece. These two romantic composers were somewhat stranded in America, after the First World War and also the Russian Revolution. And I think of Liebeslight as their swan song.
was the Liebes Life by Chrysler. And it's over to you, Peter. Thank you, Valentin. That was wonderful. Sorry, I will mute you so there's no echo. Yeah, really nice piece. I didn't know it before. And I uh, can tell you when you are playing the piano, it looks very similar to the Rachmaninoff picture we have, of course, also from the right side and also uh, the silhouette was quite similar. Um, impressive. So maybe you must check afterwards in the video. Um, this piece you just played, uh, I know best from a famous comedian harmonist recording. Not sure whether you know it. No, I don't actually. No. Uh, okay. I can just recommend everybody to look it up in YouTube, wherever. Of course, totally different style. Thank you very much, Valentin. And um, as you said, just to give you a short rest, we want to present here the program that will be played in two weeks' time on Sunday, 16th of May, same hour as usual, 15.30 London time. And I mean, this next time, a very classic um, composer team, Bach, Schubert, Chopin is almost everywhere. Every time present, I think every time actually, and uh, Maurice Ravel. And um, yeah, just maybe to mention from Schubert with the Enpontus, we already had four of them. If we include this uh, first concert in this uh, church, and now it's going over to the Opus uh, 142. So, of course, we all looking forward to see you in the next concert live or in a later uh, visit of our recording on Facebook or YouTube. We will again announce it on YouTube as early as possible and on Facebook as well as early as possible, but that means just one week ahead. And yeah, thanks for joining today. And uh, once more over here to, to your um, comments uh, on the on the Chrysler Rachmaninoff Corporation. <laughs> oh yes, I do, I, love, I do love my Sacha Torte. I lived in Vienna for a year myself actually when I was a student. So, I, and my mother is from Vienna, my grandmother. There's some pictures in this room actually which I have inherited from my Viennese family, from my grandmother in particular. Um, and. Um, Mm. I do actually try to always include one composer whom I hadn't played before. So Rachel, you come in there, it, uh, that, uh, it, it's nice. So next time it will be Ravel. And today, of course, it's Gottschalk and Gershwin we haven't had before. Chrysler we certainly haven't had and so on. And, and uh, so it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a, uh, yeah, we, we try to always do something different. In fact, the Joe Doe you're hearing in the next concert is kind of Ravel's uh, um, uh, impressionistic piece written just before J. Doe, so the two of them fit very nicely together. Now let's finish our concert with the another American composer, Mr. Gottschalk. Um, Louis Moreau is there, you can see him with top hat and so on, and, and he was a, a great character. He published some diaries, and they're worth reading apparently. I haven't read them myself, but they, they're, they're, they're a bit of a classic about America and his travels and so on. Now, he was the first successful American composer. He was born in New Orleans, and like many American musicians after him, he made his way to Paris. He wanted to study at the Paris Conservatory. But before he had even played a note, he was told that somebody from a savage country, such as America, could not possibly be admitted as a student. Basically, it meant a non-European could not become a musician, according to the Paris Conservatory. Well, Gottschalk performed in Paris anyway, and he had enormous success. He went on long concert tours, and one of these took him to Spain. In his concerts there, he played improvisations on Spanish dance tunes. And the result you can hear in these souvenirs from Andalusia, 
you can see it there at Souvenir Stand at Sea. It is called a caprice, the concept, but it's just one piece. It is the type of music, it is the caprice, because it combines different dances um, in, and, and then varies them and so on, yeah? It is a very entertaining virtuoso piece, and I think it pulls out all the stops, really. Um, and um, one more little thing I heard from Rochelle today is that today is her husband Alan's birthday. So this is for you, Alan. Happy birthday.
well. That's really nice, the German comments. Um, it, 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 I think it's a very creative and, 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 and lovely piece. Um, it, it, it's, it, yeah, it, it's always fun and it, it's not that well known. Not many people actually play this in concert. It is quite difficult, but, but um, I always thought of Gottschalk as, as really a, a, a great fun uh, character in the in the in the musical in the musical world he did actually withdraw to South America in the end and and um, and, and died there eventually um, it's a slightly sad end he had although he had been you know he had enjoyed you know great success in his life um, with this piece and it's also interesting this is really the first piece of Spanish music that we have in many ways um, because all the Spanish composers that we, we, we play now are, are really much later than this. Is, this is from, the, from 1852, as, as you can see here. Yeah? Um, so I, I think it, it, it's quite a, it's a, it's a fun, fun find, this piece. Yeah? Um, now, I'll, I'll play you one, one little encore. Today is actually not a very long program, and, and, and so we've got uh, plenty of time to play an encore. And um, this is the first program where we didn't have a... Where we didn't have a um, anything by Chopin, so I will play a little Chopin Nocturne as an encore. But Peter, perhaps you want to say something first? Sorry, I was just confused. That's fine. I'll play my Chopin Nocturne. It's one in F sharp major, opus 15, number two. So this is obviously a very complete contrast to the Goldschock, a very quiet piece to dream away on a Sunday.
Thank you, Rachel. That's very nice. Thank you all for listening. It's it's been really very nice to 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 play for you, and thank you for your comment, Ralph. Mm. It's wonderful. We really look forward to seeing you in two weeks' time. There'll be shorter gap, and um, thank you very thank you very much again. Yeah. yeah. Thank you also from my side. Greetings from Germany, and. Have a nice rest of Sunday afternoon. Oh, thank you, Bettina. That's very nice. Lovely to see your comments. Marilyn, great. I will look at all of them and I will also try to respond on, on YouTube or, or Facebook. Mm. Oh, yes, Cornelia. Hello. Eric, thank you very much, Eric. That's lovely. Thank you, Paul.